All right, welcome to the sixth edition of Uncomplex. Um, what do we got going on around the state this week? Uh, I want to remind everybody that we, the OJCC, will be at the uh, Workers' Compensation Institute in August. Um, we're having a meet and greet on August 18th at 5 p.m. That's the Sunday before most of the uh, classes begin on Monday. The mediation program uh, runs that Sunday and will conclude uh, at about five o'clock. We're going to have our meet and greet. Uh, we do not have uh, the capability of providing uh, refreshments or anything like that, uh, but we're going to be in the Anaheim, Atlanta, and Boston rooms in the Hall of Cities right there in the main lobby of the Marriott Hotel. Uh, it will be a great opportunity for us to uh, shake hands with you and for you to have some in-person uh, opportunity to uh, talk with our team uh, the mediators and many of the judges will be there. I fully expect that uh, our new director or acting director, um, Judge Schwartz, will also be present. Uh, and so it will be a great opportunity. I, I wanted to remind everybody also that we've got the uh, Workers' Compensation Academy, the OJCC production, coming up on October 18th, 2024. We're going to be back at the Orlando District Office for that presentation. We're looking for uh, applications or expressions of interest from uh, younger attorneys. When I say younger, we're not talking about chronological age, but we're talking about folks who have been in the workers' compensation practice for uh, something less than, than seven years. And uh, more likely, we're, we're going to uh, favor folks who have been uh, in the practice less than, uh, than three or four years. Uh, that is a program where you can get temper uh, and uh, instruction on evidence, uh, procedure, rules, uh, all kinds of pretrial and uh, preparation advice, professionalism advice. And we've got a speaker coming this year to talk with everybody about uh, artificial intelligence. And that, of course, in itself is uh, something that's going to be huge, I think, for many, most or all of us. All right, uh, what do we want to talk about today other than AI? We'll come back around to that. I just wrote a blog post on scheduling. We've got a lot of misconceptions about scheduling and I thought it'd be good to try to have a conversation about it. Um, there's a perception out there that the, that the uh, judges and or our database are capable of knowing when lawyers have commitments on their calendar. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, we know that a lawyer may be scheduled for a mediation with uh, with uh, Anna Gonzalez, for example. Uh, we know that a lawyer might be scheduled for uh, a hearing with Judge Walker, for example. But there's there's no way for Judge Walker to look uh, when he's scheduling to see if there's a conflict with Miss Gonzalez's calendar. We could probably uh, ask the program to check those things. But I want to tell you why we don't tell the program to check those things. A great many law firms in this state uh, will have somebody who's got their name on the door file a notice of appearance in a case, and he or she is, in fact, watching that case, but he or she's not going to attend the events. Another lawyer in that law firm also files a notice of appearance. And that's somebody maybe with a little less experience. Maybe it's a partner down the hall who's covering things. And we have no way of knowing when we notice a mediation, whether it's lawyer A or lawyer B or lawyer C, who's going to appear for the employee or for the employer. And so the database can't really effectively check for actual conflicts. And we think we would create as much mess with such programming as we would create solution. So it's important that lawyers keep an eye on their scheduling. Now, as odd as it sounds, and I don't know if there's truth to this, but I had a story recounted to me of a lawyer who failed to show up at a hearing with a judge. An order to show cause was issued. The lawyer then writes back an explanation to the judge of why they didn't appear at the hearing as noticed. And the excuse was, I was already scheduled for something in front of judge so-and-so or mediator such-and-such. -such. I get it. Uh, calendars can conflict. The solution to a conflict on the calendar almost never will be just ignore the order and don't show up. 
uh, I say almost never. When will it be an excuse? Okay. If you're in an automobile accident, okay, and you're being tended to by the paramedics and you don't show up to a hearing or mediation, I think anybody's going to feel like uh, you're, you're certainly well excused. Um, you have a death in the family and you decide to drive out to, to where family is. And the last thing on your mind is the fact that you've got a hearing this morning. I think that's a pretty reasonable excuse as to why you don't show up. But when you get noticed that 130 days from now, you're going to be in a mediation with Ms. Gonzalez. And then in 20 or 30 days, you get a mediation that for that same date and time, Judge Walker wants to see you for a hearing. The time to fix that is when you get that conflicting notice. How do you fix it? Will you contact the judge's uh, staff? Or if it's the mediation notice coming in where you've already got something stacked, it's contacting the mediator. It, that is if you don't have somebody down the hall in your law firm that you can't go down and talk to and see if he or she might be able to cover either the mediation or the hearing with judge so-and-so. It's, it's really not the sort of thing that you should be putting off and trying to deal with when you're on the verge of or in the moment of that conflict. I know. Why, why do people put it off? Honestly, it's a pain in the neck to get people on the telephone. I get that. It's difficult and challenging to find another date and time that will work. I get that. And there is this misconception out there that everything will resolve. Oh, this hearing won't actually be necessary because we're going to do A, B, and C. Oh, this mediation is going to come off because we're going to get this resolved and I'm going to dismiss the petition or they're going to dismiss the petition. Those are all wonderful thoughts. But boy, if that hasn't occurred about 15 or 20 days out, it's time to get on the telephone and try to figure out a way to work through that calendar conflict. I know people get sick of hearing me say it, but professionalism matters. When you don't show up for something, that leaves somebody, the judge or mediator, and somebody else, the other side of the case and their client, sitting, waiting, with nothing to do. The, the worst instance I heard was a, a, from a private mediator who related to me that they opened the mediation Zoom. This didn't require travel. It was a Zoom mediation. And claimant's counsel did not appear for another 75 minutes. For an hour and 15 minutes, the mediator and the employer carrier were sitting waiting for claimant's counsel to appear. When they did, they had a very good explanation of why they were tardy, but it, it wasn't a death in the family or an automobile accident. It was they were double booked by accident. They went to the thing they thought was most imperative, the hearing. Well, okay, but how discourteous of, of, of them to not be able to send a simple email to say, I appreciate that y'all are, are ready for this mediation. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be an hour late. It's just not that hard to treat people with a little bit of common courtesy, a little bit of dignity, a little bit of respect. Increasingly, uh, we are seeing the, the issues in workers' compensation devolve from a lack of personal communication. It is not that hard, here I can do it, to pick one of these things up and make a phone call, right? And talk to somebody. Uh, it just, those those that are watching or listening to the podcast without the video, I just uh, miraculously lifted my phone handset off of the, the uh, receiver and, and managed to hold it up to my head as if I was going to make a phone call. Um, this is not that hard. If you talk to people, my best advice for lawyers, if you talk to people, you will make progress. It, it, you may not get the thing you're after today, which is acquiescence for your motion or provision of the benefit or whatever it might be. But if you talk to people, instead of texting at them, instead of emailing at them, you will build relationships. And it is much, much harder to be coarse or to be obsequious with somebody with whom you have a relationship, somebody you know face to face. Part of your job as a lawyer is to get to know the other people in the practice and the community. Getting to know them and building relationships with them will empower you and make it much more possible or practical for you to get what you want. And ultimately, the job of every lawyer is to get what they want. 
<laughs> that's not always going to happen. Okay. Uh, Mick Jagger hit us with that a thousand years ago. But your job is to try to get what you want every time, right? Some people think that you get that through vinegar and through uh, just pure aggravation. And there are lawyers out there that make a very good living by being the most aggravating kid on the block. Boy, over time, if, that, if that's something you can do and not have it eat a hole in your stomach, God bless you. Uh, I think over time, that sort of approach to things becomes very hard on people very stressful. The other way to get things is, is with a little sugar, and that is being uh, friendly with somebody, being gracious with somebody when they need the continuance saying yes. Uh, even when your client might be a little perturbed about it, sure, consult with the client, right? And just remind them, you know, if we don't give them this extra two days or this extra week to respond to discovery, then we may be on the other end of this one day. And it builds relationships. It also gets your client a chance to understand that you are uh, not just a lawyer uh, or a gladiator, but you're a human being and you're somebody that can be counted on to look at the big picture and try to get the job done. Let me turn to, uh, again, uh, just so everybody knows, I'm always watching the chat box. So if you have a question, I'm happy to address it, put it in the chat, uh, and I'll try to keep my eye over there. We've had an awful lot about this, of discussion about artificial intelligence, uh, and I don't know if you've uh, followed any of it. I do a lot of writing about artificial intelligence on my blog, and you're welcome to tune in there. Uh, we're starting to pick up some exceptionally well-written articles out there on the uh, professional platforms uh, from uh, various bar associations. This is dangerous. And and other organizations that are, are jumping in and they're, they're addressing what artificial intelligence means to us and how it's going to impact and affect us. I had a, a lawyer ask me about a week ago whether artificial intelligence will mean the end of the practice of law. Um, wow. Let me tell you about technology. I, I know I'm an, I'm an old, old guy. Years ago, I worked for a little corporation in the Midwest I worked in a, a document production center. And what we did literally every evening is we went out to people's offices at the company and we took all of their paper and put it in boxes and took it back to Mount Crumpet, sort of like the Grinch. And then all night long, we had people that worked the night shift that Xerox copied all of that. And we were so impressed by that technology. Xerox machines were fantastic, right? So we ended up with paper copies of everything that was in Joe Schmo's files. The next morning by eight o'clock, we would have his files back to him so he could work. And then people in my job would spend the day reading those documents and looking for words, right? They were words that might be responsive to a subpoena. And today, you folks don't understand that. Today, you've got uh, PDF documents, and you've got optical character recognition, and you can scan for things, and you have programs that actually scan and categorize and organize these documents for you. Wow, be happy with that. But guess what? Everybody that did my job back in the day, the gatherers of those files, the people that stayed up all night copying, the people like me that spent all day reading them and highlighting them and getting them ready for some lawyer to look at, all of those jobs disappeared with portable document format, okay? And I'll tell you about my supervisor. My supervisor at that job was a paralegal. She had gotten her paralegal degree because the company had eliminated her prior occupation. You're not going to believe this. Before there were word processors, folks, people sat in a room full of typewriters and they typed documents over and over and over again. They'd get finished with it, send it upstairs. Some lawyer would mark it up and down it would come and it would all have to be retyped, sometimes thousands of pages. Word processors came along and put all of those typist folks out of business. So what did they do? They evolved. That lady became a paralegal and she was managing this document production operation with probably 40 or 50 employees and paper. You can't imagine the paper we had. Um, if you've see, ever seen the movie, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, our warehouse looked a lot like the warehouse shot at the end of that movie, just paper everywhere. 
So is artificial intelligence going to mean the end of the practice of law? I think the answer to that's a resounding no. I think word processors didn't kill the practice of law. I, I think that PDF format didn't kill it. E-filing didn't kill it. Okay. And if those things did not mean the end of the practice of law, the fact is, from my perspective, that AI is not going to mean the practice of law ending in any way, shape, or form. All of the tools of technology that have occurred over my lifetime, I mean, I remember back when they invented the automobile. You can't imagine what it was like before that. Uh, you can't imagine back before we had telephones, okay? That was real. And all these things have made us more powerful, more effective, and more efficient. Well, that's all a great thing for us. Our job as professionals is going to be to figure out how to effectively and efficiently engage this technology in a way that helps us do a better job for our clients, okay, and helps us make a better living. It will make us more efficient, just like legal research on the internet has made us more efficient, just like telephones have made us more efficient. So... I don't think you're in a point of panic, but what things should you be thinking about and worried about about artificial intelligence? Uh, if you go to my blog, uh, if you can't find my blog, you can Google Judge Langham blog. You'll find it pretty quickly. Uh, there's a search box up in the corner of it where you can search for things like artificial intelligence, robots. This stuff is coming. What does it mean for you? Uh, it means you're going to have to figure out how to make it work and you're going to have to figure out a way to ethically use it. Uh, why are we worried about the ethics? Number one, for AI to answer some of your questions, you have to give it input. And so if you're taking your client's information and dumping it into, a, we call them LLMs, large language models, if you dump it into some LLM, you're literally putting that data and information on a computer you don't own. It's like storing things in the cloud. And if you don't think that people can breach the security on the cloud, I would suggest you Google that because it, not a week goes by that some Hollywood star doesn't have their photographs or their personal information lifted off of some cloud somewhere. Uh, there's no such thing as a cloud, folks. It's just someone else's computer. So if you are putting your, your client's information into the LLM to get an answer, you may be disclosing information that you're supposed to keep confidential. And that works for both the employer and the employee. So how can you get the answer you want? Well, you, you don't put in the fact that your client's name is, is Charles Smith and, and that they were injured on this date and they went to this hospital. Use the LLM, the large language model, it, with more generic information to try to get you started on your quest. Uh, Someone is injured in a car accident. They're in Iowa. Uh, they missed 18 weeks of work, and now they're requesting authorization for a surgery. And what cases would support the authorization or the compelling of that surgery? Now, you've not given anybody's personal information in that example. And yet, the LLM is going to respond back to you and give you some things that maybe will help you in getting down the line and developing better information. The fact that you can't put in all that personal information is what's going to mean that LLMs and, and AI are tools for your use, not replacements for your professional practice. What else should concern you? Um, I've, I've been looking for a case. I know it exists. I've read it. You get old, you start to lose stuff, folks. And uh, I've been on Westlaw the last couple of days, and I've done search after search. I just could not find that case. Well, I, I finally gave up, and I jumped on an LLM, and boy, it found the case. It gave me the citation. Uh, I, I jumped into Westlaw with the citation, and Westlaw says the LLM's wrong. The LLM made up the address or the site for that case. You've got to be very, very careful about any legal authority that an LLM gives you back. Uh, if you haven't heard the horror stories, there's a lawyer in South Florida that has been uh, banned from federal court or bankruptcy court, I believe, for a year. Uh, there's two lawyers up in New York that have been fined in the thousands of dollars. There's a young man out in Colorado, just out of law school, just past the bar, just getting his feet on the ground, and he's been suspended for three years from the practice of law. 
Why? Because they listened to LLMs. They took what came out of them verbatim, pasted it into a pleading, and filed it with the court, in our case, with a judge. Is that going to get you in a lot of trouble? Well, I sort of think that the answer to that is adult diapers. Um, forgive me. I think it depends. I think it depends on whether you intended to do it. I think it depends on whether you check that citation in a reputable source like Westlaw or Lexis or these books. I think it depends on how you handle when, when it comes to light. The young man in Colorado really, really had a chance. The judge called him on the carpet and said, I don't think these are real. And as soon as the judge said that, the lawyer started backpedaling. That's human nature. The lawyer started shifting blame. Oh, it was a clerk in our office. That's human nature. That lawyer would probably still be practicing law today if that lawyer had looked the judge in the eye and said simply, judge, I have made a tremendous error here. And, and I don't expect any sympathy from you, but I would appreciate the opportunity for you to strike that pleading. And if you would give me a day, I will file a new pleading and be back here at your discretion to explain to you our arguments. You are so much better off to own it, admit it, look somebody in the eye. And if that person you're looking in the eye has got the guts to tell you that he or she has never made a mistake, never committed an error, get their name and phone number and you call me. I, I would love to talk to that person. Everybody that is in this practice of law is a human being. They all make human mistakes and errors. You're not going to get anywhere by trying to buffalo them and lie to them. You're much, much better off to just admit the problem, get on with it. Now, what if that LLM had given me the answer in five seconds that it would have taken me days of research to find? What if that LLM, uh, I, I know a fellow that, that writes an article for a monthly magazine, and he admitted to me candidly he used an LLM to write one of his articles about five months ago. It took the LLM literally a minute to produce the article. He spent about 30 minutes editing it, and he sent it into his publisher, and the publisher paid him for it at his regular hourly rate of three hours for an article. Any problem with that? Any problem with somebody billing their client for three hours or two days of research when you used an LLM and it took 15 seconds? Well, nobody cares what I think. And frankly, nobody probably cares what you think either because the bar has already spoken to this. The bar has already addressed the ethical concern that comes with the AI. And the concern is that you cannot, you cannot bill your client for the time savings that you enjoy because you've used this tool. So it's no different than Westlaw. It might take you two days to find the case in these books uh, and Westlaw finds it for you in 15 minutes. Does that mean you can bill your client for two days of research? No, that's not true. Well, that's just a fact of the matter. The other thing that the bar has already spoken to in, the, in your Florida Supreme Court is how you can rely upon this AI in terms of your practice. And they've said that it is no different than the way you would rely upon a staff member, a paralegal, a secretary, a, a law clerk in your office. Lawyers are obligated to supervise the people that work for them. That's what the bar rules say. And the bar now says that that is no different in terms of supervising an artificial people, an IP, I, uh, AI, whatever you want to call it, right? If something comes out of the AI and you're going to put your name on it, you have to verify that it is correct, that it's appropriate, and that's consistent with the rules regulating the Florida bar. If the AI comes up with some wild accusation or some, some uh, defamatory statement that you can't put it in your pleading and simply say to the judge, well, you know, I didn't come up with that. It was that guy, that AI guy. You're responsible, ultimately, for whatever comes out under your signature. And so in using AI, you've got to be particularly careful about how, when, why, and whether you're representing it. We don't currently have a rule that says that you have to tell us if you've used an AI. Uh, there are jurisdictions around the country that are adopting those rules. Uh, there are courts, particularly a couple federal courts, that have adopted that requirement. 
I don't see that as becoming widespread. Uh, I think that these folks are going to realize that that representation or that certification is not of much use. We will see. But we do know that you're going to have to be careful. You're going to have to supervise the work and you're going to have to be the professional. What else? Um, two, three weeks ago, I got a, uh, a story about an AI dispute. Lawyers are in front of an appellate court. One of the parties in the case wrote apparently a wonderful brief and cited some authority about why they should prevail on appeal. The other side somehow did a poor job of research in their Westlaw program. They could not find three of the five cases. Boy, when that happens, you want to stop and think a minute. Why can't I find these cases? What could it be? Uh, you might have your Westlaw set on Louisiana law from the last project you're working on and you're looking in the wrong jurisdiction. Switch it to Florida. Uh, the opinions that are cited might be the kind that are not always available on Westlaw. They may be something, a trial decision. You got to go look elsewhere. Maybe you've misspelled something. The opposing lawyer in that appeal filed a motion with the appellate court and asked for that brief to be stricken. It was a very adamant motion. It was very accusatory. It was very, very angry in its tone. And they wanted the other side's brief stricken. They wanted the, the appellate court to take a stand. Now, come to find out that all of the cases that were cited by the party are all reasonably easy to find. Now, we can't explain why the lawyer couldn't find them. But before you jump to the conclusion that someone's acted inappropriately or unethically, before you jump to the sanctions, I would encourage you to maybe sleep on that and maybe think about whether there's any way in the world that this could be an innocent mistake. Now, the lawyer did the absolute right thing, as I've already told you. The lawyer picked up the phone and called, not the other lawyer, Call the other lawyer's secretary. Discuss the problem with finding the case law with the other lawyer's secretary. The secretary, of course, couldn't help him. Filed the motion. Now, would that have gone any differently if the two lawyers had actually spoken with, with each other? Would it have gone differently if the two lawyers had a relationship with each other? Would it have gone differently if the lawyer could have picked up the phone and called and started the conversation with, how are your kids doing in college? Or how's your daughter doing on the t-ball team? Or whatever it might be. If there is relationship, there is less opportunity or enticement to problem. I encourage you to build the relationships. I think it's ultra, ultra important. Uh, we, we're getting a lot of discussion about... Uh, Rule 1.280, uh, some of you may have noticed that the Florida Supreme Court last week uh, amended Rule 1.280 that has to do with uh, many, many things related to discovery. And I almost instantly, when the opinion came out, got an email from a lawyer very concerned. And the, the approach of the concern was essentially, uh, how is this going to impact us in workers' compensation? And the right answer to that question is, I don't know. Um, do we jump immediately into rulemaking? Lawyers need to remember, okay, that this office is not part of the Florida court system. We, we are absolutely not a court. Uh, lazy lawyers call us court all the time in motions and in other pleadings. Uh, oftentimes, even during arguments, I have uh, lawyers tell me well, what the court should do or the court this or the court that. I try not to interrupt them and remind them that I'm not a court. Um, some people say I'm probably at least a half gallon, and that's sort of insulting, but I've lost a lot of weight. Maybe I am down to a court with a Q. I'm still not a court with a C. So that's something to think about. When the court changes court rules, that doesn't mean that our process necessarily is impacted or affected. We have our own rules of procedure in 60Q. Right? That's the Florida Administrative Code. We're an administrative office. Our process and procedure is governed by our rules. I know that can get exciting. 
uh, and it can get confusing because for some reason, the appellate courts seem to think that a good way to interpret the law in workers' comp is to go to the rules of civil procedure. But those don't apply to us. And, and when courts apply them, uh, that means that they're probably right. Uh, you may have heard the old adage, uh, the appellate court is not last because it's always right. It's right because it's last. And that's an old Supreme Court justice quote that I can't give you the uh, the attribution for. It's not my material, but it's a pretty darn good thing to, to remember, okay? So if the court says that these rules apply, well, then by gum, they probably apply uh, until and unless the next panel at the DCA uh, gets their hands on it, and they might change their, their mind about how a rule does or doesn't apply. Uh, in the meantime, we probably should follow the precedent. And that's what we're here for as judges and as litigators. If you don't want to follow the precedent, your job as a litigator is to explain to the, the trial judge why it should not apply. What's the distinction? Uh, what's the difference? And why shouldn't it work the way, in your case, it has worked in other cases? Um, boy, don't ask an artificial intelligence to come up with that answer. That's something that people like you, with your brains and your acumen, are going to be essential for. I don't care how smart the computers get. So back to rule 1.280, it's broadly about discovery. Uh, what do we know about our rules on discovery? Yeah, we're not controlled by the court rules unless the agency adopts and incorporates. And that's what we've actually done, folks. So if you look at the 60Q rules, there are at least three instances where we have adopted and incorporated the rules of civil procedure for the practice and workers' compensation. The use of depositions, for example, yeah, the disqualification of judges, for example. And so that's the kind of specific authority that you would dig for, that you would look for in terms of trying to build your argument of, of why the case should go the way you think it should go. Will Rule 1.280 apply to discovery and workers' comp? I don't know. It's a great answer, right? It's your job, the lawyer's job, to figure out why they would like it to, to function and apply or why they would like it not to, and then to make that argument in front of the assigned judge in your case. Ask the judge to apply it or to prevent the application of it and explain to her or him why, in your case, it does or doesn't, should or shouldn't, will or won't. That's the lawyer's uh, trade. That, that's your profession. In time, we will begin to see some rulings. Uh, first of all, that rule 1.280, the changes aren't even effective until January 1 of 2025. And so we've got six months before this is really going to crop up in any kind of meaningful way. So we could sit today and we could debate how we feel about it and what we think about it. But at the end of the day, it's probably too early. We're going to see what some judges think. We're going to get some rulings. Uh, we're probably going to, in time, see an appellate ruling or two where somebody's going to be perturbed or upset about an outcome at trial. And they're going to ask the appellate court to have a look at it. We'll see if the appellate court does or doesn't will or won't, should or shouldn't, and they'll tell us uh, their interpretation of the path forward. And with that, uh, we'll be off and, and moving in a, in a direction that we can all sort of grasp, and we can continue to have arguments before the trial judge about whether those, the direction uh, is a direct line or whether it deviates at times here or there uh, based upon beliefs or particular applications. So, Instead of getting all wrapped around the uh, should it or shouldn't, does it, does it or doesn't it, I think that, that the things that are worth thinking about is that there are at least uh, some likelihoods that pieces of the rule before it was amended uh, are arguably very applicable in workers' compensation. Uh, things like attorney-client privilege and work product privilege. Uh, I suppose you could you could mount a good argument as to why something should or shouldn't be privileged. But I think you're going to have a hard time arguing to a, any judge that uh, attorney work product is not a real thing or that attorney client privilege is not a real thing. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure you can make those arguments. We've got a lot of creative lawyers out there. And, and I'm not saying I can't be convinced. Perhaps one of you will talk me into uh, those not being uh, applicable. 
but I think that's going to be very difficult. Now, as to some of the amended items in these new things, uh, the idea of full and fair upfront disclosure. Uh, they've written into the rule for civil cases that as soon as the complaint is filed, uh, the defense is supposed to forward certain information and documents to the, the plaintiff. And in the same sort of mindset, the plaintiff's supposed to furnish uh, documents to the defense. And, and why is that? Uh, they're trying to short circuit delay. They're trying to get cases moving. And they're trying to get the parties in the case to be a bit better informed about where they stand and what the perspective of the other side is. Well, my goodness, folks, we've had that in workers' compensation, not in a discovery rule, but in our pleading rules for a long while. Uh, the petition for benefits requires all kinds of detailed information, right? The response to petition is more than just denied. And if you've ever done any civil practice, that's what you get oftentimes. The, the pleading for a, a complaint is all about notice. And the defense is oftentimes nothing but the word denied, repeated for 422 sequential paragraphs. Well, we've already got some disclosure in our system. And that may or may, may not make a difference. So the answer is, I don't know. 1.280, we will see. Uh, there will be some evolution. And in time... I think we'll get a better idea. I'm checking back again to the uh, chat box and I don't have any chats or questions. So questions are welcome. I'll try to keep an eye on that. Kind of hard to pay attention to multiple things at once. Um, we're continuing to see an awful lot of challenges in terms of motions to compel uh, stipulation or compel settlement. There is some uh, inkling out there uh, amongst certain uh, injured workers, I think more predominantly, but I think some employers also, that things that are said at mediation are so absolutely privileged that you could say the words, I agree, or I will accept that, or I will pay that, and and that that is not in any way binding. Um, well, I, I would caution you that anything that is said or written in, in terms of resolving a case or resolving an issue may in fact be admissible. Uh, your clients may be held to representations that they make. They may be held to agreements that they sign, even though they're not formal agreements. And so things communicated by email, I'll take that much money, I'll pay that much money. Those emails may get uh, paraded in front of a judge on a motion to compel resolution. We've got to have better communication. Uh, it's disappointing when I'm, I'm hearing from lawyers that uh, oftentimes they tell me uh, that they're going to mediation without their client. Now that's troubling. Uh, I'm sure the client's got lots of things to do in a given day. Uh, if it's an injured worker, they may be back to work or they may be going to the doctor. They may be having family issues. I get that. If it's an employer, they may have other tasks, challenges, or meetings that are keeping them from that mediation. But at the end of the day, that mediation is an absolutely fantastic opportunity to look somebody in the eye, even over the internet, and talk to them about the way you feel, to hear about the way they feel, to get a feeling or an inclination about their perceptions, about their thoughts, and about their, their view of where the future of a, a an argument or a debate might go. It's invaluable. And sure, the, the lawyer can be given authority by the adjuster, but then the lawyer's translating what happened for, for, at mediation for the adjuster. And the adjuster or the risk manager getting that firsthand may be much more powerful. Not to mention the fact when those people show up at mediation, I personally believe that it communicates to the injured worker who's also present a tremendous amount of dignity and respect to the process. Uh, you're not just a number. You're our former or hurt employee, and you're important enough to us that we took time out of our day to come to this mediation because we want to hear what you have to say. I think the claimant should view it the same way. Uh, the claimant should show up for that mediation. The claimant should be there with the camera on. The lawyers should certainly always have the camera on. There is absolutely, well, okay, 
If you don't have the bandwidth to carry the signal, I get it. If you're sick and home, I get it. You don't want to move the mediation. You want to get this job done for your client. I get that. But in the vast majority of cases, you ought to show up at mediation and you ought to be professionally dressed. You ought to be comporting yourself professionally and you should have the camera on so that everybody can see it. It is a communication of respect. It's a communication of dignity for the process and it shows that you are, my word, a true professional. Turning off the camera uh, is troubling. What happens if, uh, if instead of a mediation, it's a, a hearing? You show up at a hearing and your camera's turned off. And the judge says to you, I'd like you to turn your camera on. Uh, what's, the, what's the appropriate response to that? Well, back to the adult diapers. It depends. Um, I think a perfectly appropriate response is, judge, I'm, I'm working from home today. I'm ill, but I did not want to try to get this hearing covered. And I would appreciate it if I could leave my camera off. Uh, that's not a demand. That's a request. Yeah. Demands and arguments are really not the way to respond. Uh, either turn the camera on or explain to the judge why you can't or don't want to. Can't. Well, why, why can't? Bandwidth could be a problem. I understand that. Um, the equipment could be a problem. Uh, not every camera is going to function forever. Uh, even when the microphone's still working, the camera may not be. Don't misrepresent that to the judge. But if that's the problem, why not say that? Combative and vinegar is rarely the way to get your way. Um, build the relationship. Turn the camera on. Um, wear, wear a professional outfit. It's not just about the way you look on, uh, on the way up, okay? Um, we had an instance here a couple months ago where the, uh, the lawyer had to get up and get something out of a file box behind them. And they got up, they were wearing uh, basketball shorts along with their tie, their shirt, and their jacket. Uh, that's just not a good look. Uh, it's not a demonstration of, of dignity. Uh, boy, if you get yourself caught in that position, for goodness sakes, why not uh, tell the judge that you're uh, going to have to turn the camera off for a moment while you uh, retrieve your file? Before you stand up, think about what you're wearing. It's, it's troubling. Back to professionalism, just to, to sort of round us out. We're already at 1240. I'm getting no comments or questions in the chat box. I really do like questions. Um, but what are we seeing in terms of the numbers? We're starting to run numbers on 2023-24. Uh, A lot of people don't understand that whole uh, annual report concept. Uh, and we don't use the Julian calendar the way that most people do. Our first of the year is not January 1st. In state government, the first of the year is July 1st. And so our calendar runs from July 1st through June 30th. Um, I know there's the detriment that that's confusing. There's also the benefit that uh, you get two New Year's Eves every year. Uh, so you can go with the January New Year's Eve. You can go with the, uh, that's silly. We're starting to run numbers. Uh, petition for benefit filings look to be up. Uh, new case filings are probably going to be up also. Uh, we're seeing an increased volume of filings generally in terms of the documents coming in and hitting our system. We continue to see in that regard uh, a challenge with people naming documents. Um, everything that hits our inbox, uh, somebody here has to look at, whether it's the judge, the mediator, or staff. And we're relying upon what you name those documents when you file them. So if you, if you will name your documents appropriately, that helps us to know whether we need to look at, I know somebody needs to look at all of them, right? But goodness, if it's a motion to compel discovery, we might've already told one of the staff people that they're in charge of looking at all of those first and getting them together for the assigned judge. Somebody may be focused on settlements. Somebody may be focused on uh, voluntary dismissals. And so if you don't appropriately name the document, yeah, we're still going to look at it. We're going to look at everything that comes in. But you're going to delay the process. 
Mr. Weinstein, finally a question, a hard question. Any chance of doing a live episode at WCI? Well, that live episode, we actually are, our August uh, uh, podcast is on the 14th, uh, which is the week before WCI. Uh, if we did it live at the, uh, at the comp conference, we'd have to do it on that uh, Wednesday, the 21st. And I don't know, I don't know how I feel about that, but it's a, an interesting question and I appreciate it. I will look into what the logistics would look like and, uh, and whether we would be in any kind of financial outlay to make that happen. Uh, but I like the idea and I'm going to make a note about WCI and we'll see what we might be able to do. It, 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 it's sorry to interject, but it would be cool to uh, maybe have a, like a, a little live audience and maybe a microphone where people could come up and ask questions. Wow, I'm almost shuddering at the thought of an open mic in an environment that's uh, that's inherently noisy as that place can be. We would have to find a, a reasonably quiet place to do something like that. Uh, the hallway noise would be, I don't know, I, I'm afraid would be deafening at times. But uh, maybe on Wednesday, maybe not so much. Maybe things will have cooled down by then a little bit. I don't hate the idea, uh, and we'll look into it. So with that, we're we're running up against the uh, the end of our 50 minutes. It's uh, 12:46. I'm looking for any other questions and not seeing them. Uh, I'm I'm pleased to see so many of you tuning in. Could we have a question answer episode where we can send in the questions before? Absolutely. Uh, my email address is literally all over the internet. Uh, it's also uh, right down here in this corner of the screen. Uh, it's David Langham uh, with a period, david.langham at doah.state.fl.us. And I encourage questions uh, throughout uh, the month between now and July. I'll be collecting questions. Uh, and those questions uh, at times steer what we talk about. Uh, and I certainly would be happy to address any question that you have that you submit in advance. Um, but you'll be stuck with whatever the answer is. No, I don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl. No, I don't know the winning lottery tickets. Uh, no, I, I don't know whether the judge will buy this argument or that argument. Um, so, you know, maybe don't ask me things about opinions, but happy to talk with you about any questions you have about the law, uh, technology, professionalism, uh, the challenges of being a young lawyer. Um, I know y'all don't think that we remember this, but yeah, I remember I was a young lawyer once. It was yesterday, maybe maybe last week. Uh, you're going to turn around at some point in your life, folks, and you're going to wonder where all the days went because it really does feel like last month I was starting out on this, uh, this odyssey that I've been on now for more years than I'm willing to admit in a recorded format. Um, not seeing any more questions. So that'll be the a wrap for us today. Remember, August 18 at WCI for sure. Anaheim, Atlanta, and Boston on the 18th Sunday at 5 o'clock. And we're looking for younger lawyers for the Academy on October 18th, 2024 at the judge's office in Orlando. Email me if you're interested. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll hear you, see you next month on Uncomplex.